and your reaper. Those kids out there seem mad thirsty. You got something for them to drink? Yo, we could wet up two cups of blood. <laughs> So, welcome. Oh, hello, Velocet. It's nice to see you again. It's, it's nice me, Mechno. Yes. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> this is three cups. No. <laughs> okay. Two cups of blood. Two cups. Sometimes we have a third, but it's not That's official. True. Um, yeah, so today we're opening up with a somewhat official cocktail. This is a recipe I found online. I saw the name, and I, I had to try it. And it also looked fairly simple and delicious. So it's called the White Bat. Mm. And what we do is we take one and a half ounces of white rum. We add a half an ounce of Kahlua. Um, one and a half ounces of milk. So it's heading in kind of a... Mudslidey without the it's vodka. An, it could be treacherous territory. It's a little weird. And then three ounces of cola. So it's more of a float kind of a thing. And of course, you know, on ice. And garnish it with mint. Optional. And uh, it's interesting. You know what? I think uh, I think we should have taken this in a slightly different direction. Yeah. Are you lactose intolerant? I'm not. Okay, I would have said, fuck that milk. Let's go with heavy cream, because almost any time you substitute heavy cream for milk, upgrade. Yeah? Instant? Instant upgrade, exactly. Move to the front of the line, you're good. Uh, and also, maybe some of it, it could have ruined it. I'll give you that. But maybe add some of those cherry bitters from last time. Oh, snap, I didn't so think of that. So it'd be like a cherry Coke float thing. We can try that. Round two, if you like. Okay. Unless well, you have another plan. I don't. You're usually the cocktail master. What well, happened? Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, you know, I was so distracted. I was uh, I was thinking about how excellent the theme song oh, that we're shut up. bandying <laughs> now is. That's like fucking professional shit, bro. Well, I do my best. Your best is the best. Nah. Hey. My best is something. Um, but yeah, I was happy to finally sit down and, Jesus, you know, we need some theme music and I put together something that I think works. So. I find it uh, delightful. I think it's, uh, I, don't, I have personal feelings on it. It's got you certain think- points of nostalgia. I don't want to go into it. I don't want to color anyone else's trip. They can, yeah. they can just enjoy. Well, I know what you hear in it, and I just uh, want you to know that that was not intentional. But I love I, it. I hear what you're hearing now I, that you said it. It's great. It's great. <clears throat> so we'll just leave that vaguely out there. But anyway. I think we need one of those wheels. Now that we have a like. Wheel? Yeah, like, yeah, we have this set topics that we go through. Like, we'll be talking new music, maybe okay. movies, books, whatever. Random we should, Yeah, we should have a wheel so we could just like. Spin that thing and awkwardly sit there while it's clicking, and then it like lands. Oh shit, books! I didn't read shit. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Let's spin it again. <laughs> that would be fun, but we have to be prepared for all those topics. Like, oh yeah, I read this thing, and I can't remember the author's name. Like, we have to, <laughs> we, we have to have that shit together. I don't know. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think our audience gives us latitude for a bit of you know charming, <laughs> charming disarray. Well, those five to ten people are very generous. Oh, shit, we're growing, man. We're up to, like, <laughs> maybe 12. All right. It's great. No, there's a few A few people have complimented me saying that they they listen and they enjoy it, and they wouldn't think just listening to dude, two dudes talking would, <laughs> would, like, float their boat, but it's a good boat, I guess, or a good float. Maybe. Speaking yeah. of floating... Yeah. Oh, I did not. You I didn't got, do that yet. What is wrong with me? I got to do I, Come on. Did I publicly confess what my hesitation about the uh about the no, sensory deprivation? No. I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast. So, Velo nope, said look, was, look, what? We set it up though because floating might not mean much to some people. What so there's mean? a new 
float place in the okay. capital region. There's two locations. Yeah, go into it. And it's a sensory deprivation thing. Yeah. And you lay in a tank of water that's heavily Epsom salted and you makes a, makes you extremely buoyant. And you just float effortlessly. And uh, there's a light and you can turn off the light and you'll be in blackness and it's very quiet. And you put silicone earplugs just to seal off your ear canal so the water doesn't get in, but it mm-hmm. helps block the sound. And they keep the water uh, very warm temperature, like 92 or 94 degrees. It's about your skin temperature, so you don't really feel it. Once you, once you get still, the idea is you have no sensory input, and it allows your mind to, to relax or to run wild for a little bit until it like figures out, okay, I can settle down now. And if you get in the zone, you really feel like you're kind of floating in space. And it can be interesting. Now, <clears throat> when before I had spoken to you about your experience, I was really looking forward to something potentially terrifying. <laughs> like I was like, oh, I, I hope I lose my shit in there. Well... That's up to you. Because I, I like all kinds of excitement, and that sounded, to me, that sounded good. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, your post review where you're like, you know, you float there, and you're like, oh, shit, my arm is real, like, my arm hurts. I'd never notice it because there's too much shit going on. And, like, my shoulder is a little messed up, so I'm like, I don't want the depressing sensation of like, oh, wow, my body feels like a piece of shit. It's really falling apart. Well, I I think if you're prepared for that eventuality, you can get past it. Okay. Just just I was very aware that I couldn't relax my shoulders fully. Like, that was the one part of my body I could not get the tension out of. And I'm like, God damn it. And then, you know, you bump into the side and you have to reset yourself and try not to push yourself too much so you have the momentum that you just hit the other side and... It's a bit of a learning experience the first time, and that's why I really want to go back. And I still, I haven't gone back yet either. So, I got to do it. <clears throat> you should. Well, I, I am planning. Speaking of going back, I am going back to Great Barrington this okay. this weekend. Uh, you know, Father's Day weekend's coming up, and I'm going to visit the. I think it's Theory Wellness that I pick up gifts for my father there. And oh yeah. You know, it's a it's a beautiful place, a good experience, and I think honestly, I was just reading an article that by twenty twenty one, the majority of states are going to be fully recreational for marijuana, so it's becoming less and less of a a big deal. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah. Um, you know, the governor wants to make things happen in New York uh, next year, I guess, or I don't know. Oh He's- shit! I really hope the cops don't like kick in my dad's door. Maybe, maybe, maybe cut well, my dad. dad out. Your dad lives in a state where it's legal, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, I guess. I guess he is a Massachusetts resident, so that works. Okay. There you go. Yeah, so that's a good gift. There we go. He's all set. Wink. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> it's so good. This is not a video podcast for so many reasons. <clears throat> oh, most definitely. Um, but let me just let let's return to the drink for a yeah, second because I think feel like we glossed over it. So the white bat, obviously the title has goth, you know, value. Mm-hmm. Um, the drink itself, it's very, as it's mellowing, as the ice, you know, melts a little bit and it's really blending. I don't know. It's getting very, it's got the dairy thing going. It's got a little bit of sweetness. Um, I say it's growing on me. It's very mudslidey <clears throat> without having the vodka or the actual Irish cream. It's kind of in a very similar area for me. It's, it's. It's pleasant. Yeah, it's it, not bad. It's not overpowering. You're not, you're not, even though there's a shot of rum in here, you don't get, like, a burn. You don't get, like, a... No. There's no. no, there's no like, grimace or anything. It's just, like, a pretty pleasant beverage. Very easy. Once you are acclimated to it, very easy to just, like, sweep through the whole thing easy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying not to do that too quickly, but uh, it is tasty, and it's something you're not going to taste the alcohol in. So if that's your jam, uh, this is a fun one. Yeah, very good. All right. So if we were spinning the wheels... Oh, Jesus. Would you talk about... I, <clears throat> I came... So we usually talk about 
you know, new music and what we found. But that that led me to a question that might be pertinent to DJ, other DJs who are out there listening. I know there's a couple of people who spend some time with us. And they might have a question of how is it that you find new music? Um, I can just say I've been paying attention, uh, looking on, not exactly looking on Bandcamp, but once I have, uh, once I find the name of an artist that is either related to or recommended by something else I like, I'll go try to track them down on Bandcamp and see what I think. And for people who don't know, some people don't like Bandcamp, but honestly, for, um, as far as I'm aware, it is the best marketplace to sell digital music because you get most of the the artist will get most of what you're paying. Far different from buying it on iTunes, um, they'll get the biggest share if you support them on Bandcamp. So we'll just throw that out there. But um, really, it's just about taking the time to go looking. Like you hear about things, you might see something on Facebook. Um, obviously I follow, you know, I follow Negative Gain, I'm on Metropolis's, um, mailing list and, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. And once you start following artists on Bandcamp, you'll be made aware of their, um, you know, future releases. They'll, they'll, it'll let you know. So all of that stuff I think, uh, helps. And sometimes you just get a random, you know, you see a random sponsored post and if it looks cool, just go check it out. Just take the time to actually check it out and try to divert some of your attention to trying it out. It can be tough. Um, Well, yeah, that's something that I find uh, I've actually been criticized for, like, if there's music present at any time, my attention is always partially divided like focused on that music and it's just here it's just a habit that's come up where like i'll be like this music is driving me crazy and usually the the response is what music because it's just so background that like it's meant to not really come up but i'm i just like in the grocery store i'll fixate on like what is that song you can barely hear it but like i just i get the tempo i get the the little high points and So um, it's, it's, it's the same thing for me. Like my brain, just my attention automatically, that's where it goes. Someone can be talking to me and it's so hard to pay attention if there's something, uh, music playing that I'm engaged with in any way. Like it's really hard to focus. So I think that's a big plus that like most people who are aspiring DJs at the very least have a passion for music. I hope so, so. like they, they're going to naturally like tune into stuff i actually conducted a mini interview with a local dj dj omega telic mm. uh, about her methods of finding new music and i'm actually kind of surprised her methods and your methods have quite a bit of overlap so because she does a lot of shopping on <clears throat> excuse me they do a lot of shopping on Bandcamp themselves Bandcamp has certain algorithms to help suggest other artists. And they'll go ahead and they'll like click through and listen to new stuff that way. And it's actually not too bad a way to discover new stuff, even if you didn't necessarily have, you know, XYZ artist as your destination. You end up there and you're like, oh shit, that's pretty good. Yeah, let me um, throw two more things out there. That come oh, to yeah, mind. keep going. I would say compilations can be helpful. Oh, yeah. But a lot of digital-only compilations will just keep inflating the track numbers to make them just crazy dense. 400 of the United States tracks you should know. It's It gets intimidating. So if you can't, like, listen to 50 unsigned artists to, like, find the one you like on this comp, yeah. like, you know, that can be tough. So th- those um, haven't really been very effective for me i still try sometimes but i don't i don't know if i haven't had great luck with comps but i will say i have um uh i have had some luck researching like if if a band you like is doing a show or a festival and you see the ad for it it's like in seattle or somewhere you're not going to get to you're like fuck man it would be great to see them 
if they're on a bill with some other acts that you haven't heard of, check them out. Because, you know, odds are maybe not extremely sonically similar, but they'll have a similar feeling or some reason why they're they're right. getting on that bill together. Yeah, so do some detective work. They're that can good. definitely be a, a good tool, I think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, if you're at a club or, you know, wherever, it doesn't work so much for live music, but anything that's a recording that's being played, you can usually use your phone to say, you know, what song is this? And then do some research later after, you know, if it was... If it struck you so much that you asked, what song is this? There's a good chance you'll like more from that artist, maybe. Now, do you use an app for that, or you just use Siri? I know you have an iPhone. So. Yeah, Siri actually is Shazam. Like, her... Oh, the her, back end there, is... Yeah, Siri's, okay. Siri's back end is Shazam. And <clears throat> if it doesn't, you know... Most of the time when I do it, it's... This sounds really familiar, but I can't remember who it is. Who is this? With some occasion, it, I'll want something new, and it'll tell me. But I find that, like, looking at the the previous results of the things you've looked for is kind of cumbersome. It doesn't, like, lay it out there clearly. You have to kind of do a little digging. But, yeah, it's uh, it does a pretty good job of recognizing. Every once in a while, it's completely wrong, which I, I have no <laughs> idea how it, like, thinks Harry Belafonte is like a new shiver track, but Hey. Hey, you know, hey. Room he, for improvement. That's right. Um So there's a there's a corollary. I don't want to burn through all my stuff right off, but it's Okay. Give me a music segue. You are going, let's say, okay, you are going to spin in Phoenix, Arizona. No, Tempe. Different. Okay, all right. You're going to Tempe, Arizona to spin. You don't know these people. Nope. You don't know the Arizona scene, much less the Tempe-specific scene. How do you prepare? How do you, how do you like, get your head in that? What do you do? I think because I do mostly classic tracks, it's easier for me. I think a DJ trying to be a little more contemporary, a little more electronic dancey will have a harder time so i'm gonna do primarily my own thing because if they ask me to do it they want what i do right that's true so stick you know <clears throat> stick with your style that you're known for number one uh number two as annoying as they can sometimes get advanced requests are sometimes very useful to get the temperature of an area um, usually in a lot of the events that I've participated in, we have a request post on Facebook, uh, a week or two before the event. And mm -hmm. that gives us some direction as to what do these people want to hear? You run into the danger of, you know, people could throw stuff up there and then they won't show up and you're going to play one weird song for one person who's not even there. Um, but you have to use your, your taste and your discretion to find something that, fits within your style that people want to hear that you think is popular enough that not just that requester might want to hear it. So Yeah, that's very um, that's very lucid. You know, you Yeah. You can take all you're open to all suggestions, but don't they shouldn't feel bad if their suggestion doesn't make it into your playlist because you're an artist. You you give a you give a you give a painter a new color and they appreciate the new color and maybe it'll come in handy later. But if it doesn't fit with what they're trying to do right now, you don't take it personally. It's just you made a suggestion of what you like, and maybe you've actually inspired something else in their selection by what you have suggested. Right. So, yeah. And, and I would say, you know, if your track, if you show up, so two tips for, for club goers. If you show up, if you made an early request and you show up late, and either and you don't hear your song, it might have already been played, mm -hmm. because early requests are typically going to get played early unless they are just barn burners, like super awesome right. tracks. If it's a crusher, you hold on to that. Yeah, you you save that for a little bit later on. So if it's kind of a weirdo thing and you requested it early, show up early, um, and that'll give you more of a chance to hear it. It'll also give you a chance. If you don't hear it in the first, you know, hour or two, 
you can hopefully make that request live, either if there's a request book. It's always more polite to write something down if there's the opportunity than to uh, speak to the DJ. Some DJs don't really like to be sort of interrupted while they're trying to do stuff, and the pressure of being social while you're working can be hard to deal with for some some people. I'm I'm kind of that type. <laughs> As for an introvert, I'm pretty damn friendly, and I really don't like when people feel like that's the right time to have a conversation. Because, mm-hmm. you know, DJing does take focus, and if somebody is talking to you and asking you questions and not being concise with their request, it really, like, they don't know, like, how much time you need in order to execute what you have planned. That transition could be fucking a bear. could be really precise. Yeah. It could be tricky, but they don't know. They don't know what's going into it. They just feel like, hey, Dimitri Vegas, you gotta, you gotta play it, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, I would just say... If you make an early request, you know, understand if you're requesting something a little obscure. Like, if you're trying to help the DJ, like, hey, there's this chameleon song, then no, it's not one of the popular ones, but it's, like, really, really good. That might be a tough one to work in, you know. Um, If, if, you know, if if the DJ thinks it's not going to go over well... Yeah, They're probably not going to play it unless it's for more of an atmosphere kind of setup very early on. And they might try to honor the spirit of your request by playing a more popular song by the same artist. I know that can disappoint people, but sometimes, you know, oh man, you want to hear the chameleons, but I have to play a song people are going to know. You know, that's that might just be the way. Um, so was, yeah. try to have some sensitivity around that. And, and if, you may, if you're there early enough, you can make your request live. And that might reinforce, okay, the person who wants to hear this is here, or, you know, at least two people might want to hear this. I'll I'll try to get it out there. Yeah, I mean, I have seen, um, early in my DJing, in my club DJing career, I was told if somebody writes something, if somebody gives you a written request, take it as literally as possible. Don't, like, play a remix of that song. Don't play, if they wanted a remix, don't play the original. Respect that they asked for something specific. And for years I held that true. And now I have a more, like, shrug of the shoulder response, which is you play what you think is going to make that person, the room, and yourself happy artistically. If, you know, there's been, I I have never talked to a person who have made a request who, like, put down, like, the, like, super obscure, only available with the Mountain Dew Redemption Code remix. (laughs) They put that down, and I say, well, I really am happy with the the Mindless Faith remix. Would you be okay with that? They're almost, they almost, they they always go, oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that, that would work. Because they just really want to hear the song. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just the sensitivity of them realizing that you don't have an infinite collection and that you kind of ha- you're going to do your best for them, but you may not have that super, um, super enthusiast track that they have hunted down that was on some sort of like magazine insert promo only thing that's super rare you might you just might not have it now i don't want to bring up a subject that made voltaire a little sore Mm. but you i have seen you in the past Mm -hmm. be so accommodating Mm -hmm. that you will either in the background uh rip a song off of youtube so that you can satisfy a request have you played things live off of youtube because, I mean, I, that's really going above and beyond is my real point. I don't really have a... <clears throat> excuse me. Jeez, my the allergies are so bad today. I apologize to all the ah. people who are listening. Um, I don't really have a mechanism for injecting a live YouTube stream into... I just say, like, you know, I have I have certain sensitivity to Voltaire as an artist who, like... You don't have to go into that. Well, I get it why he was irritated, but at the same time, got to unclench. Like, if, if everyone in the room could possibly go to YouTube and listen to that song for free individually, 
just get over it. Just let it happen and be happy that people want to hear something. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same. And, you know, it's getting it out there. It's letting people hear it. It's inviting more people uh, who might be interested in it to go track it down. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. never, but I've never actually live streamed from from YouTube. I would be really hesitant to do that, just because you don't. You want to take every precaution to not have like your set ruined by a streaming error or by like a joke track, which just has like some teenagers like singing along in the middle of it or something. You don't know what you're going to get with YouTube, so pre listening is kind of important. Well. The point really that I was making was um, it's very nice of you to even try to do that stuff. I don't think the public can expect a, a DJ to try to do anything like that. Like if, if your DJ doesn't have the track, the, the fight is over. You know what I'm saying? Like if they don't have it that night, if they're not prepared to play it, they're, they're not going to play it. Well, I guess that's, you know, that's, it's all the DJ's shtick, I guess, which is like my shtick is... I will take any kind of request and try to work it in. Even if it's completely inappropriate, I'll try to find a way to make it appropriate and work it in. You have the crazy style where you can yeah, you I, do that stuff. You know, yeah. and I'll I'll do weird things on the fly to make it kind of work. Sometimes very successful, sometimes like I get a C plus. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it but happens. hey. People like my specialty is the 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. slot, so people are forgiving or ready to go home anyhow. That's pretty, fine. Pretty punchy one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. It usually works out. Yeah. Um, are we ready to talk about some music, or you want you got more DJ? Well, I was just going to add, you know, you touched on it a little bit, and I thought it was good advice, which is, yeah, this I'm going to show my age, because I actually said mailing list, but... If you are interested in an artist, one way to to find more like that is to look at what label they're on. Mm -hmm. Because record labels are often a collection of artists that hit a certain demographic. So if you're just getting started, I suggest looking at the Metropolis Records uh, new releases. You can get on their mailing list, uh, Out of Line will give you some stuff. So Metropolis has Agent Side Agent Sidegrinder, Static Bloom, uh, God Module, Out of Line is good, Hosiko, Blute Angle, Massive Ego, uh, Infacted Records, Accessory, SITD. You, did I tell you what SITD is? Yes. I think yeah. we talked about it last yeah. time. Right. I love that. <laughs> Grendel. Uh, then you have like Cleopatra Records, which has like a lot of cool dark wave, older sounding stuff. Not always older stuff, but older sounding stuff and classic sound. Yeah, and plus they have the, every once in a while they come out with an amazing product, like the Occult Box. Oh yeah, is like a five CD, just amazing like product of art. Everything about that is great. But anyhow, or Alpha Matrix, which has like some good like electro poppy stuff that's just just fun so that's you know that's a pretty a pretty good method is you know figuring out what labels you like and paying attention to what they come out with well speaking of labels i wanted to do a label spotlight this time on tiger squawk records oh i think i know the owner of that thing or the the chairman what is he i don't know the uh, international crime lord yes there we know. go so um so yeah, I actually we're talking about Brian Graupner, uh, who Graupner Graupner, who um, runs the label and it was of course the creative force behind the Gothicals and you know many side projects, gasoline invertebrate, costicles, night sickles, every sickle, lots of sickles, very many sickles. So um, I actually sat down, uh, well, video chatted with Brian and. Uh, did a quick interview just to figure out what the um, ask him what the label was about and and uh, uh, just some basic stuff and um, check that out and then we'll talk about the music. Yeah, let's listen to that. With Tiger Squawk, is there a, a certain focus or philosophy or sort of mission statement you're after, or what what's sort of the the main idea with uh, what you're trying to do? 
Well, um, th- it's basically uh, a front for our uh, VCR repair correspondence course scam. And um, we obviously can't put that money on, on tax forms and stuff. So I started a record label and um, got a bunch of really wonderful bands to, to put stuff out under that mantle. But really, it's to commit crime. Okay. Very nice. Um, so how did, how did the whole thing come about? How did you get started down this road? Well, in, in 2019, do you really need a label like, I mean, I've, I buy everything digitally. I haven't bought a CD from Best Buy in uh, 10,000 years. Um, so I sort of started it as something to put on Gothicals releases. And then my friend Steven, who does a wonderful band uh, called Club Ovator, uh, who I play with in the Gothicals sometimes, asked me if he could be on my label. And I'm like, yeah, if you want. Now, I brought this story up to him, and he says he was kidding. So <laughs> this whole thing may just be an accident, um, or it may be the best front f- for um, laundering money from our illegal Liechtensteinian competitive Pac-Man gambling ring of, of all time. Very nice. Um, so, yeah, it, it seems like the label has grown quite a bit since then. I was trying to just take a casual quick count last night. It looks like there's something like 14 artists on there. Yeah. It's, um, it's gaining some steam, man. Like, uh, people are reaching out to me like, uh, the UK's Bitman. uh, the gospel was played a really awesome festival with him in London recently. He's going to be at, um, uh, Infest coming up, which is of course a great, uh, British industrial festival. He's like, so, um, what's up with tiger squawk? And I'm like, I'm doing that, uh, that Fred Flintstone run with a feet. Just go down, get a dog, get a dog, get a pew. I'm like, yeah, you're on it. You're on it. And, um, or like pill brigade from Seattle's like, so this tiger squawk thing, like everybody talking about it. I'm like, you want to be at it? And yeah. So it's, it's been tons of fun, man. Um, it's it's really going uh, better than I could have envisioned. World spanning, uh, all over the place, man. Are you kind of looking for more artists? Are you just open to uh, whoever contacts you? What's what's kind of the mode you're in right now? I'm pretty like uh, I'm a cheap date. Like if somebody comes to me. Uh, that's, that's a, you know, you're 80% of the way there. Um, it's, we're, I suppose the word collective, although that's kind of a charged word would be closest. Like we have a really great artist community. We're trading remixes and music tips and, um, uh, supporting each other through promotion and uh, I'm pushing out Tiger Squawk stuff as hard as I can. Um, the, uh, although we are putting out some great comps like this comp, we've, we've done two uh, quote unquote battle compilations and one of them hit number one for EBM or industrial or something like that on Bandcamp. The one with um, finales label industrial records. Yep. Uh, yep. So, that's great. There's there will be uh, a free giveaway compilation at this festival coming up uh, in Seattle, the Mechanismus Festival. That uh, that's out. You have to find the Pill Brigade guy to get a copy. But like, it's awesome. Uh, it's really great. So there's a there's like you may get a five dollar <laughs> PayPal check from me every now and then. But um, no pink Cadillacs, but you get a ton of promo and uh, uh, a community. So that's that's sort of where I'm at right now. So, you know, if that sounds good to you, reach out. Cool. And what's the best way for people to do that? Just uh, Facebook, yeah, I whatever mean, they got? Yeah, well, I mean, as a, uh, a, a front for our, our witness protection program for lesser-known cryptids, 
if if you are a lesser known cryptid like the Wisconsin Wumpus or the the Massachusetts Mastodon, you know, we sort of got you already. That's our fiduciary duty. Um, otherwise, my name is Brian Graupner, and you can just message me on Facebook or email me at uh, darknes at gmail.com. Is there anything else? Uh, if you were going to try to sell someone being on the label, you, you kind of mentioned um, what you try to do for the artist. Is there anything else you want to put out there as uh, an advantage or a perk of uh, being on the label? I mean, uh, you get to talk to me. So, you know, you're 90% of the way there. Uh, but, you know, I don't know that uh, Kansas City's science fiction would get a chance to remix Sydney, Australia's Isserly otherwise. Or uh, uh, the, the UK's Bitman might collaborate with um, Norway's Industrial otherwise. It's a great sort of through road. Um to say nothing of you get to be on the best record label out there that's of now or has ever existed since the birth of the recorded sound. I think that's, a, you know, one in the win column. There you go. Um, you mentioned a couple things coming up. Is there anything else in the works that you're getting excited about that uh, you well, want people to know about? The um, everybody's sort of kicking butt uh, individually, like, Club Ovator is going to be opening for um, uh, Hosiko in uh, Victoria, Canada. Uh, Virtual Terrorist has just been on a on a tear lately, pardon the pun, um, with some really great gigs. Uh, they'll have a new release soon. As far as Tiger Squawk goes, uh, there's we pulled off this comp that will be a free physical giveaway. Look for Alex at uh uh seattle's mechanismus festival he's got a giant beard he'll have the biggest beard in the place say like hey i heard about that tiger squawk thing and you get a free cd uh, nothing definitive i have been talking with some other labels about the third in our battle comp series um i can't say that label uh right now but it's it's very fancy Sounds very cool. Um, okay, we're pretty much getting into the bonus round now. As far as like administrative overhead, you know, what? How does that impact your day to day? Trying to run around and wheel and deal, and um, you know, keep an eye on the artists, what's coming up, you know, what you're trying to do for them. I tell people like right, away, like I used to tell people, um, Tiger Squawk Records is a JPEG. Like, it started out, like, you can put this on your thing if you want to look like you're on a label. Like, I mean, to be perfectly honest, no one's going to kind of care about as, your stuff as much as you do. Um, and uh, I've had some frustration with other labels in my life, so I'm going to give you uh, all the power. You sort of get Tiger Squawk for free, and uh, we'll just go that way. Uh, now there's some, there's, there's a little bit of money coming in with, um, people being generous, uh, for the whole pay what you may on band camp thing. Uh, best case scenario, uh, you get like the middle sized coffee today instead of the small one. Like, but, uh, to actually get back to your question, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Um, it's, uh, I need to keep a lot of plates spinning to sort of function as a human. So uh, it, it helps me out to sort of um, uh, 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 traffic cop a lot of all this Tiger Squawk stuff. And um, like a lot of the weight is really lifted by the, the community itself, like this physical comp. That was Pill Brigade's idea. And then science fiction had the idea to call it Crouching Tiger, Hidden Squawk. And then everybody um, from uh, Syncom in Los Angeles to uh, uh, Soundwitch on the, on the East Coast, uh, New York Zone, 
uh, was uh, contributed. So it's um, I I do like a little bit a steer in the ship, but it's it, we we're almost full communist. Like I'm not the kind of guy that would go out and be like I'm going to start a record label. It just sort of it really grew. Um, Mostly from Stephen goofing around at the Terminus Festival, uh, and uh, but it turned into this really wonderful thing. So uh, I'm 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 happy to be where I am. Anything else you want to throw out there? Anything you want to add? Um, I am a giant Velocinate fan. So if you know that guy, uh, tell him just say what's up from the Gossicles dude, and. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Like, I would be too starstruck to ever meet him. I heard you got a line on him, so just, like, let me know, okay? All right, man. <laughs> well, all right, thank, you, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. to. Hey, I, I'm on two cups of blood. The pleasure's all mine. All right, man. All right. Later. Have a great day. Appreciate it. All right. Swamp Thing. Bye. <laughs> so there you go, from the man himself. That's cool. I didn't know you were such a kingpin. <laughs> Allegedly. So. Wink. <laughs> so I mentioned there's there's um, quite a few artists on the label now, and I just want to maybe just go through um, a few of them, give you an idea what they're about. Of course, there's the Gothicals, which if you don't know, how would you describe the Gothicals for a new? You song? know, it's so many times that if you say comedy, it really. They're comedic, but really, their music, they're, it's really good music. And it, they're clever and comedic, but it is good music. It's not like a joke. It's not comedy. Comedic without being comedy. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and yeah. Some, some production that's getting very, very scarily good lately. Yeah, he's, uh, I think, I think uh, Brian is all the time upping his game. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and we mentioned a couple. Uh, Brian has a few side projects. Gasoline Invertebrate is kind of the more um, straight, industrial, more serious side, I guess. Yeah. And uh, the Causticals is Brian and uh, Matt from Caustic. Yep. And they have some stuff out. Um, one or two things under Tiger Squawk, I think. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, and of course the Night Sickles I also mentioned. That is the Goth Sickles plus Night Stop from Finland, which um, is pretty much like a synth dance industrial type stuff with uh, with Brian on vocals. Very cool. So <clears throat> a few of the other acts. Um, we have Sex, Death, Religion, which... Um, I'll just give you a quick impression. Yeah, go for um, it. Sort of mid-tempo electronic dance music, um, very synthy with uh, a lot of samples. So not super hard, but um, interesting. Yeah, there's Soundwitch, which is sort of I would call it almost dark noise in the ambient. Now is it realm. witch? Witch is in like spooky, or witch is in sandwich, like edible? bread thing i think it's supposed to be witches and spooky okay <laughs> i don't think it's sound maybe, maybe it's both have a snack have a sandwich you I, son of a bitch i guess <laughs> okay. yeah i think there's a bit of a double thing going on there okay uh beta virus which to me has more of a techno feel um and then we get to science fiction uh science f with uh psy okay science fiction um they have a couple couple releases on there. Their um, their older stuff, I think, is a little more uh, ambient. Might be the wrong word, but a little more atmospheric. Not quite as uh, straight ahead dancey. Okay. Uh, I really liked. They have a record called "The Album Is a Lie," which has a portal theme. So there's a lot of uh, portal samples. Oh, of, that uh, sounds delightful. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Um, and that one is very electro dance, industrial, very club worthy. A uh, bunch of those tracks. Nice. So that one I would definitely recommend. Um, Isserly has a bunch of releases. Now I know a lot of people would criticize uh, Isserly, Iserly, however you'd say it, as like 
abrasive, maybe? Some of the stuff can be abrasive, but yeah. I feel like it's it's a a more true manifestation of Witch House. Like it makes you feel a certain way, and that way is not always good, but it's very rarely unintentional that you come away feeling a way that they that she didn't intend for you to feel. So that that's my take. It could okay. I could uh, I don't know this person. I could be completely wrong. Whatever. Self-described as the saddest girl in Australia. Um, it's it's electronic experimental. I would call it mostly sort of experimental music with mm-hmm. definitely with some noise elements. Um, some of some of the tracks and remixes have more of a steady beat. Some of them are just kind of I don't even know how to put it. More atmospheric, I guess. Mm-hmm. Just more intending to make you feel a certain way. Yeah. So some of that is really interesting stuff. Um, we have Type Trauma, which is electronic, uh, again, like co- kind of an electronic dance industrial um, stuff. And there is also Syncom, which is more, I put it more in the EBM realm. It's still like electro-industrial with a little bit more of an EBM feeling. If you didn't make it clear, what is your favorite of your list? Well, let's finish the list first. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> There's a few more. All right. So Crudmouth is another Brian side project, but it's has it's more rocky. I think he, the description is actually, I think Brian uses the word grunge in, okay. part, in part of the All right. line. But All it's, right. I wouldn't say it's grungy, but it's guitar music with, with Brian uh, singing. Uh, there's also Pill Brigade, which is kind of uh, industrial with some like screaming, some heavier screamy vocals. Okay. I mentioned the Costicles already. And then uh, there's Albany's own Siren, which is more of a relaxed um, stuff. Some some of the tunes have beats, some are more ambient. Some, there's a couple in, instrumental tracks with uh, like a classical style vocal. So... I think that rounds out everything Brian has up there right now. Okay, yeah, good good to have a complete list. And your favorite? What's what's taking it for you? I really liked uh, other than the Gothicals, other than Oh yeah, the, the Gothicals are are great. I'm uh, also going to cut out his side projects. Okay. You can't take Costicals as like a second. Mm, that's okay. okay. Go for it. I really, I really enjoyed uh, science fiction's uh, the album is a lie that that I mentioned already. Yeah, the, I mean, I wasn't a huge Portal fan, but it's so cute what they did with it, and and really, uh, I don't know. I thought the songs were really good, and with the samples, it was it was pretty oh, cool. That's that's awesome. Yeah, ch- check it out. I do want to recall for a second that I know that you have no affiliation with Tiger Squawk yet, right? No. Okay, because I do know that your version of One More High Score hmm. is the best version there is. It is the ultimate. It is the perfect version of One More High Score. Well, thank you. I can't remember which. I think he only has one of the remix albums on Tiger Squawk. Oh. And I think it's not... I, I think it's uh, Sick Remixes. I don't think it's the... The one you're talking about. That's a that's a tragedy. Well, do you yeah. are you do you have a remix that's on Tiger Squawk? I do. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, uh, the name of the remix record. Yeah, sick remixes. Um, this is what the Bruja Clan will do to all. Oh, you okay. Gangles. Yeah, you did. You did well on that. I the, remember the that. Potence mix. Yes. So very that's good. available. Cool. Um, yeah, and then you know. Uh, Tiger Squawk, if, if you're not familiar, check them out. If you like anything about the Gothicles, you might like some of these other acts. Um, so, yeah. As, as something else I have to highlight. Yeah, please. Uh, because it was so good, and I, I liked it so much. As I said, I follow Negative Gain. I don't mean to pimp Negative Gain every episode, but... You know... They had a new thing, and it was like, "Oh, we're releasing a signal from a band called Cult Tastic." And I'm like, "I don't know these. I don't know this. Like another thing from Narrative Gain. Geez, everything is coming out now, and I don't have time for this." So you know, a week passes, two weeks maybe. I check out this track, and it really grabbed me in a way that I didn't expect to to be drawn in. So the band is called Cult Tastic. It's one word, 
And the track was Excel World, A-C-C-E-L, Excel World. I really love it. Like, it's, it's has a certain feeling that it kind of fits in my down-tempo-ish kind of trip-hoppy thing, but it's not just that. It's also very current electronic. Um, it's very forward cyberpunk feel. Yeah, like I totally dig it. Yeah, it's it's cool. Um, since you shared that track with me, I've become quite a fan. Uh, Chimera, um, she can't get past her album covers. Like, their album covers, she's like, they're a shit poster. <laughs> but they kind of have real bad album covers. Well, let's say that Chimera is a visual artist. That's so true. That is like her sticking point. That's tough. That's where it uses the <laughs> music tough. in the su- supermarket. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably very hard for <laughs> for her to get over. Yeah, so I guess that's the thing. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. But they're dope. Really dope. Yes. And I owe you a, this episode's thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Oh, very good. Um, so where do you want to go from here? Spin the wheel. Thank you also for sharing Godzilla King of the Monsters with oh, me. Oh, yeah. I'm going to give it a C plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Monster fights were great. Great great effects. The human element, you know, honestly, human element is notoriously lacking in all Godzilla movies. I mean, with the exception of maybe the Matthew Broderick run. Well, Matthew Broderick where it lacked the monster element, and yes. so it was also not as successful as it could have been. So you felt like there wasn't enough human drama? No, no, no. I just thought the human drama was tiresome. It would have been better to have cut it all out. Yeah, yeah? just get rid of it. Have, have Godzilla crush that dad immediately. Yeah, man. Uh, or the mom, who is not Maggie Gyllenhaal. She's someone who just looks exactly like Maggie Gyllenhaal. I wouldn't say she looks exactly like her, but I see what you're saying there. Too close. Too close, bro. Similar look. Um, I, I've been drinking, <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> We're entering that phase of the podcast. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, well, uh, I would say... What do you give it? Probably about the same. I mean, it's a C-plus might be a little harsh. It's, it's, not, it's, it's nothing that's going to blow you away. Up till about halfway through the movie, I was thinking it was a stinker. Oh, really? And then we got to see more monster screen time. Mm. At which point, definite uptick. Yeah. Fa- favorite monster, putting you on the spot. Favorite. Uh, I don't think Godzilla is very visually interesting. I think his head... <laughs> the proportions are troublesome to me. Uh, I thought Mothra was well visualized and I would have liked to have seen more unambiguous shots of some of that. Mm -hmm. Like if, if they put out like a a book of, you know, the visual production of this movie, like that, that might be worth looking at because true. Some of these things in motion, you don't get, you know, you get that bit of a blur on the big screen. You can't really see all the work that the artist put into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's some there was some really cool design. Um and some of the trying not to throw out a bunch of spoilers, but some of the things revealed at the end um it would have been nice to have gotten a better look at. Yeah. I mean there <laughs> there were there were a couple of big names that were notably absent, some referred to, like teased relentlessly that were absent and some that were never really mentioned that you that the true fans might have thought for a second was coming but didn't mm. so i don't know i think monster island 2 maybe well they're definitely trying to set up a franchise i i think in the i think the three movies they've done this is maybe the second best which three um there was the last Godzilla movie, whose the, title I don't remember. Well, that's tricky. Now, do you mean the 2014 last American Godzilla? I or think the so. last? Okay. That was the one that also had Ken Watanabe. Yes. Okay. Who says Godzilla like every five seconds? Well, that's what they that's pay what him for. That's what he does, yeah. Yeah. Say it. Um, 
<laughs> Go on. Say it. Okay. So I preferred uh, the King Kong movie, Skull Island. I thought that was, although oh, John C. Riley said his name, he gets a little old to me. He's not as funny as everyone thinks he is to me personally. Okay. Uh, even ignoring that, I felt that that movie was kind of better paced, more entertaining overall. Not that I'm a huge King Kong fan, I just liked it more. I'm going to have to give it a C. I'm going to give Skull Island a C and Monster Island, or Monster Island? What was it? King of the Monsters, right. Yeah. King of the Monsters, <laughs> a C+. Plus. I, I It edged out really? a little bit. I just thought that, like... Samuel L. Jackson was like, I obviously don't want to be in this movie. He was like, in it? Yeah. Oh, you mean you're talking Kong? Yeah, yeah. Oh, gotcha. no, not he was. He was not in King of the Monsters. I'm like, what? Did I miss what? something? How did that happen? <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I, visually impressive. Uh, if you want to see big monster action, I fully endorse it. If you're looking for a superlative, dramatic experience, you're going to be disappointed. I would say that Shin Godzilla, which I believe was chronologically the last but was not an American release, was an A movie. Oh. Um, it wasn't really because they used CG, but when they had Godzilla in... <clears throat> spoiler for a movie that's like years and years old, but... Godzilla had different forms, like, in that movie, and some of them looked real bad, but they looked real bad in, like, a kind of, like, eraser head holding that chicken grizzle baby way that, like, it's like, it kind of bothers you. It's like, you don't really think it's a real baby, but at the same time, you're not comfortable with this whole scenario. <laughs> Anyhow. That sounds like kind of... What you're always looking for in life. Maybe. That maybe. sounds like your jam yeah. right there. So, yeah, like, Shin Godzilla is dope. Better than King of the Monsters, but King of the Monsters was okay. And it was, I think it was a good, would you say it was a good movie theater experience to see it on a big screen? I think so, yeah. I think it was big screen worthy. And really, that's what we're looking for these days, right? We're not going to go to the movies to see... Something dramatic that doesn't have, like, some kind of big, crazy... I don't know how to say this. I think you know what I mean. You're looking for a certain level of spectacle that you're going to pay fucking almost $20 to, you know... Yeah. 15 20 bucks to go see, right? So, it's tough. It's tough to evaluate that and uh, pick a winner, you know? But I think this... I think if you have any interest in the subject matter, this one is, is worthy with that aspect. Word. Yeah. Yeah, I I have no regrets. I certainly am happy that I saw it in the theater. And if nothing else, it's because I support the tradition of Godzilla movies. I want I I like a world that has Godzilla movies. I want more. Yeah, cool. that's cool. Yeah. So speaking of the storyline. Okay. Have you read any good books lately? I am reading things. Um, most recently, I finished listening to a couple of audiobooks that came from you. Mm -hmm. uh, Deep Roots was the second one. And Winter Tide, I believe. Was Winter the Tide, other one. I, I think that's right. Um, I think the subtitle is The Innsmouth Legacy or something like that. Yeah. At least to Deep Roots. Sounds about right. Um, now, the author was Ruthanna em Emrys. Yeah, Emrys. Yeah. Emrys. Uh, they were pretty interesting. So, they are essentially, they're set in the late 40s, uh, at the, you know, right after World War II, basically. And it focuses on an Innsmouth survivor who was a child at the time of the raids. If you're familiar with H.P. Lovecraft's The, the Shadow Over Innsmouth and some of the other works. Um, the fictional town of Innsmouth was uh, invaded and basically kind of emptied out and shut down. And the idea is that those people were all hoarded into hoarded uh, herded herded into yeah. concentration camps somewhere in like Arizona or somewhere in the desert, right? Right. So uh, these Innsmouth people who are 
people of the water is what they call themselves. They they essentially start out human, they look kind of weird, and then eventually they turn into these froggy fish people and they jump into the sea and they live forever. So they, they kind of go through this metamorphosis and they, they change. Um, but they have to be near the water, they're very aquatic, so you bring them out to the desert and they just fucking die. They don't do well. No. So the warm girl is left over, and she's grown up. They release her from the camp when they release the Japanese uh, interred citizens that they rounded up during World War II. Mm -hmm. So they kind of lump them all in together because she's like one of two survivors, and they just decide to release them with the the Japanese Americans. And then it kind of picks up after that as she kind of tries to get back in touch with her culture and she's roped in by the FBI who kind of know, still know who she is and know she has a certain language, uh, you know. His, historical knowledge that is very useful. Right. So they, they rope her into certain things and she kind of reconnects with her culture. And you get a different perspective on the Deep Ones and the whole Innsmouth culture that isn't so monstrous they really try to humanize um the the you know lovecraftian monsters at least in this way and they explore some of the other races that are touched on in in lovecraft's works and they just put a different a little bit of a different spin on it so you know i think you did a really good job of of sharing what is compelling about the book you did kind of share with me that you could have liked the book more I'm curious about what, where you think they could have been stronger or what you would have liked to see or something like that. Well, it's tough because, again, similar to what you said earlier, I don't want to color it for other people, but I felt like there's a lot of um, dramatic thought narration which was a little much for me. And, and maybe it's comes from listening to it in audio form maybe on the page it would have flowed better okay i'm not an audiobook kind of guy i guess oh okay and i find it kind of hard to especially in the beginning when you don't know the character names and you're only hearing them and you're not seeing them ah right it's hard to follow at first and then you you gradually get into it but i just felt like it was very the protagonist, it's, of course, it's written by a woman and the protagonist is female. So there's a lot of, I don't mean to sound weird, but it seems like a lot of feelings, a lot of inner dialogue, a lot of, I don't want to call it like a chicky thing, but it was very, uh, I don't know, hard for me to relate to the thought processes. I guess that's funny. I, I read almost exclusively science fiction. Mm. So when I came across, you know, when I came across this book, it was before I really started a recent trend of targeting only female written science fiction because I want a different type of story. Like, I, I really want that different feel that I haven't had before. But I could see how, like, if that wasn't an element that you came for, that, like, it it might not it, it you might have a problem synchronizing with the story and like really like it, it it alienates you rather than like pulls you in. I think it was kind of the style um, more than the actual story because the the more I think about it, the actual storylines uh, and the way the plot develops are very respectful to some of the Lovecraft stuff because you know in Lovecraft you don't have a climactic you know, action set piece at the end, at least in most of his stuff, you don't. There's no, none of that classic dramatic uh, boom battle and then some kind of resolution. Right. And uh, I think she holds true to that, um, to that style. And the plot is more of these interactions that evolve a little more slowly. And there is a dramatic, um, you know, dramatic in the technical sense of the word. There's a there's a dramatic sort of conflict and somewhat of a resolution, but it's not like this big comic booky battle kind of uh, scenario. Okay, well, it's not like an actiony thing. I think you know, as far as like a not, you know, and did, you didn't hate the book. 
No, I didn't hate them. Uh, they were interesting. Uh, I didn't like them as much as I hoped I would, I guess. Oh, well, I'm sorry, very sorry if I actually ended up overselling them for you. But I, you know, I I really adore what she did. <clears throat> I've heard it qualif- or I've heard it referred to as the wicked of Cthulhu, which is t- taking the perspective that is untold and exploring that. And I I really enjoyed it. But I that doesn't change that like I can see how you wouldn't necessarily love it in the end, unfortunately. Well, full disclosure, I didn't love Wicked as much as everyone else did either. Well, I, I couldn't stand it. Because <laughs> it's a musical. I'm not in... No, no, I someone, read the book. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. For someone, I, I... Aside, I love music, but I hate musicals. Yeah, me too. I can't... I Okay. It's what it is. It is what it is, man. Yeah, yeah. It's a different style. Um, I read this dope ass book by <laughs> Naomi uh, Novik called "Spinning Silver," and it's a retelling of Rumpelstiltskin. Mm. And it's pretty loose. Like it starts out laying out the Rumpelstiltskin thing and totally being like, "Yeah, it's some people who like incurred some debts and then like found a way to fucking." cheat out of those debts and screw over the, you know, whatever. And it kind of framed it... It's funny, because it's fantasy, but it's also, like, pulling in a lot of cultural stuff, where I think if you read Rumpelstiltskin in a certain light, Rumpelstiltskin is supposed to, like, could be taken... Now, this it's tough to say supposed to, but could be taken as a, like... A Jewish archetype, and it's like a money lender who then extorts far more than the person expected to pay from them. When really, honestly, thinking back to Rumpelstiltskin, I think all the terms of agreement were made perfectly clear. It's just when it came time to pay, the the lady was pissed and and didn't want to give up her firstborn. But maybe she shouldn't agree to that. I don't know. Yeah, you know. Um, but this, it was a very interesting story, and it was epic, and like, it was well done. Where the Rumpelstiltskin story sort of splits into several different stories over the course of it, and then it all comes back together, and it was really satisfying. And I'm I'm looking forward to reading more of her stuff because, from what I hear, it's not her best work. Oh wow! So. You know, uh, I'm going to, I think Uprooted is the next one that I'm going to, like, go and dive in on hers, and it was good. Give us the name and, and the author again, please. Yeah, that was Naomi Novik. Um, and did I mention last time the thing about the refrigerator monologues? Yes. Yeah, we talked yeah, about okay, that. Yeah, okay, good. Because yep. that was also, like, surprisingly cool. Awesome. It's nice when something, like, surprises you and impresses you, you know? Yeah, I mean... Honestly, I I don't know anybody who doesn't have a commute. Like anybody who doesn't have like a good 20 to 30 minutes on their way to work. And it it really makes the drive go by if you have an audiobook to don't try reading in the car. That's a bad <laughs> that is a mistake. Well, if you're not driving. Well, yeah, if you're not driving, yeah, if you're if you're taking some other transport and you're not being rude to the driver. <laughs> then yeah, like reading, reading, reading is fine. But otherwise, audiobooks are like a great way to make you to make your commute your time and not company time that is just taken from your life. Yeah. So like, uh, not to get too you know philosophical about that, but really making the most of your time is important. Yeah. 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 For sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You've been playing any video games, son? You know, I really haven't. Um, but I've been looking for an opportunity to actually play um, Call of Cthulhu. Oh, interesting. I've had it. My wife has played it. I have mm-hmm. yet to play it. And it's moving, you know, I my spare time is spent on a musical production and then now it's nice out, so I'm trying to work on my house while while <laughs> while we have the weather. So I'm trying to not get uh, consumed by other pursuits right now. 
but soon. Well, I'm, I'm totally on the edge of my seat to hear your review. Okay. Now, I like, it's not a, in, not a terribly new title, correct? Uh, no, probably, I think it came out at the end of last year. See, that's, that's kind of my sweet spot. I never like buying new games, because when you buy a brand new game, you don't know if they threw in, like, a bunch of pay-to-win features. You don't know, like, if it's a total dog that was phoned in at the last minute. And I, this is not me being critical of the developers, because I know that the the development house can sometimes make things really hard for the artists working for them. But, you know, I, I think that when you get titles that are, like, aged out a year or so and you're still interested after that year... Like, I just played Metro Exodus, and it was great. Now, I will say it's, like, a year later, and they haven't released any of their promised DLC that they sold season passes for, so that's kind of... Well, that means they're not rushing it. That's true. Could be better, if it ever happens. No, I think they've announced that it's going to, and I'm kind of interested, but it's one of these circumstances where now the game has been out for so long that they have less investment in in that title like they could they would more focus on new titles rather than filling out promised content for an old title but you know i think this i didn't realize that metro exodus was based on metro 2030 20 jeez the next in the series of books, that there is a book that I wasn't aware of that came out. Okay. And I think that it holds closer to the book than the second Metro did. So um, I'm cool with that. Um, you play Borderlands? You've played Borderlands. Yeah. Do you have the PlayStation PSN network thing? Not anymore. May I make a suggestion? Sure. Invest in one month. Because right now you get the Handsome Collection free if you get a one-month subscription. And you get the new DLC for the Handsome Collection for free, which bridges Borderlands 2 to Borderlands 3. So it's like a whole free add-on that they just dropped, but you have to move pretty quick on that. Like By the time people get around to listening to this podcast... Sorry, folks, it probably isn't free anymore, and that DLC is probably not free either. Well... Sorry about that. If you don't join the network, I think the Handsome Collection is available for 15 or $20. It's, it's, oh, okay. not, it's not terribly expensive right now. Oh, then yeah, then, then maybe get a physical copy, especially secondhand. It wouldn't be that bad. It shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, let me just interject. We yeah. will return to games in a sec, but... Yeah. I want to say I have mixed up a round two for myself. Oh, tell testify. It's a it's a cherry bat. It's the white bat with, per your suggestion, uh, I put in ten drops of Woodford Reserve's spiced cherry bitters, which are bourbon barrel aged, and it gives it uh, more dimension. There's a more of a cherry coke kind of a flavor going on. It gives it a little more complexity. Nice. And I think it's quite nice. Yeah. Good suggestion. Well, thank you. I'm glad it didn't ruin it. Not at all. It could have. It could have. But no, it, it tasted <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. So, have you been watching the stuff about E3? A little bit. Um, There's some new, new announcements that I will let you handle. But I just want to say... It was because of E3 I found out a couple months ago they announced and have been releasing little trailers for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. Ooh. So if anyone is old enough and lucky enough to have played the original Bloodlines, they will know it was a damn good game. It had some bugs, but... Uh, Why do I feel like that's something Zilchand was into? Prob- was, he, probably. was he big into that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I can imagine, yeah. Mm. Um, quite a few of people we know, probably. Okay, go on. But it was damn good. Uh, you had a lot of choice as a player. It was very uh, open-ended before big open-ended games were a thing. 
and uh, I remember the combat being fairly gratifying, uh, the vampire powers being pretty cool, and just the, the game itself was just very well written and, and well executed. And the setting of the World of Darkness, I think it's San Francisco or somewhere on the West Coast. Okay. Uh, the this, this setting was really well done, and it was just damn good. And they're finally doing a sequel. It's not the same, you know, the original development house has long since folded, but the bringing it back and the, the trailers look pretty good. So oh, that's exciting. I'm definitely excited for that. I'll get in on that. That sounds great. No idea when it's coming out, but uh, it looks cool. Eventually. Exactly. Well, I mean, even even the big, the big hype of E3, nothing is, like, imminently released. The nearest thing that I can, that I'm thinking of is... Like the closest one is September, yeah. Which is Borderlands. Borderlands Three is September. Super hype for for uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Yes. Which, like, surprise! It's got Keanu Reeves in it. Not a selling point for me, but I'm still excited for it. Not necessarily. I mean, I think his digitized character looks really cool, and I have no pro- like Keanu Reeves. Q. <sighs> <laughs> Damn drinking mouth. Keanu Reeves is having like the greatest PR week ever because like Reddit is on fire with Keanu memes. Like it's on fire. Everything is Keanu, like the perfect angel. Like, so he's having a great fucking week. Um, I was just surprised that there was such a huge name in the game that nobody knew about until suddenly Keanu was on stage at E3 like telling people that they're breathtaking that's pretty sick i mean it probably helps when the development house is in russia or poland or wherever the hell they're from yeah i think they're polish poland yeah cd project red yep yeah um so that's like that's way off in the distance that's like not a 2019 title yeah what is it early 20 uh, they announced a date they, they? they did say a date i thought it was april 2020 but Damn. i could be wrong about that but it's out there um, for 2020 it's gonna be gonna be hype oh it's gonna be berserk <laughs> um seriously uh and you know of course there's death stranding which is like one of the weirdest games what the fuck i don't know man if did it, you watch donkey's e3 video yeah i did it's like we know nothing about this yeah like, i still know nothing fuck? it's a guy with a big ladder and okay and a backpack and a backpack and like a front milk jug with a baby in it that better have some damn compelling gameplay because what the fuck i can say that if you spend the 200 i think it's 250 dollars on the deluxe edition you get (laughs) this is the best you get a life-size bridge baby what the you, fuck? you get like a jar with a baby in it. Okay, that's kind of cool. <laughs> it, it, it is cool. Like, I was going to say before you said that, for that kind of money, you know, Norman Reedus better be coming over to, perf- you know, no, but you for got sexual a favors. Baby. But I mean, Jesus. <laughs> you get a baby in a jar. That's cool as long as they are up to like a high standard. Yeah, you know? and we have all seen like. Looking at you, Fallout 76, with the really incredible shortfall on your deluxe edition. You know, we've seen some shit, so yeah, pardon our skepticism. But, you know, on the deluxe edition, there's like uh, the Borderlands 3 deluxe edition. It was like eight hours for that to sell out completely, because it comes with a full-size loot chest. Like, yeah. the loot crate is part of the thing, and like, everyone was like... Instant done. Yeah, sure. I've got a disposable two hundred and fifty dollars. Let's Crazy. do this. When my video game comes out, mm-hmm. there's going to be a thousand dollar edition. All right, I'm into it. That's going to come with a coffin, a full size. Oh, I love it. Wooden toe pincher style classic black coffin. This is perfect. That's this my is perfect. That's my problem. Will it have like a little slot for the original game media to go in the top oh. so you can be buried with that's it? That's brilliant. Yeah, like a pocket on the inner yes. lid. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just take me away. I'm, I'm maybe, bringing this with maybe me. Maybe I can get a whole PlayStation in there. With like <laughs> oh my God. The VR headset so you can just lay in it and close it and you'll be all happy. Oh, I love it. It's yeah. kind of like a float. Exactly. You know, it's kind of like a float session. A little bit. I like it. I love it, man. God damn. <laughs> so okay, super quick. Okay, 
You know that I got that dirt cheap tractor S4. I was going to ask about that. How are you? How's I'm it not, coming along? I'm not going to drag on. We're going to keep it concise. But I will say it's a cool controller. The S4 is cool. Um, I haven't played with the S4 MK3. My, pers- my personal feeling is to avoid it because it's got motorized platters. And You've said this like I five know, times. I know, but I feel like anytime <laughs> they build in some bullshit motorized interface yeah. thing, it's a huge mistake. But don't judge it till you try it. That's true, but no. But anyway. <laughs> but yeah, no. Your S4 so, Mark II. My S4 Mark II is quite pleasant. Good. It's got a lot of colors for for the pads that you can change and assign. Um, honestly, the thing that you I didn't know you already have been living in this luxury world where you have a move knob that allows you to scroll through the song really quickly. That shit's awesome. That's my number one feature of this controller. I don't think I've used that. Oh man, when you <laughs> like spin the the jog wheel to move forward, yeah, in it's the song, not great. You're living in the in the bad part of town, my friend. Yeah. You just want that knob action. Okay. Just knob. All right, I'll check all that out. Day. Yeah, so that's that's great. Um, I played with... I had to upgrade my MacBook to um, the newest version of whatever OS X is now. Mojave? Hi. Oh, yeah. Catalina's coming. Jesus, I haven't even paid attention. But yeah, I upgraded to Mojave just so I could do the Tractor 3 play um most notably there is a view that puts the waveforms in a horizontal view one on top of the other so you can see how they interact it's something that serato and virtual dj have been doing for years and years and now finally native instruments has done it spoiler i don't love it it doesn't really make that much of a difference to me what's it supposed to show you like how they how the frequencies cancel or reinforce each other well it doesn't when you're transitioning (laughs) So, it will definitely show you the tempo. It's the the software is great about uh, the one beat. It shows you where the measure starts and counts off. Like honestly, I think if you put in some prog rock, it would be like I don't know what the fuck this is, and there'd be like beats all over the place because it's four four. It's got so when it's four four, it like knows the one beat and it like. Yeah. Grids it out for you super nice. And because of that, you can see the two tracks right on top of each other, and you can make sure the one beat of one track is lined up with the one beat of the other track, and that it gives you the best chance of, you know, especially when you're using assisted sync, you know, it's going to make sure that your tracks work together. Well, that said. It's good for beat matching. It is, but I don't know that it's a real, like, true advantage to beat matching because it's. Uh, I don't know. Uh, beat matching was never a problem when you didn't have that view either. It's it's just something. I don't know. It, it kind of is neat to see, but um, I don't know. The view is very dark. Um, uh, is, it, is it tuned for the club? It. Their rationalization was that it's easier on your eyes in a dark environment. Now, that said, I kind of found it like... I, I worried that... Both uh, Mojave and Tractor 3 did things that ate up system resources for no real reason. I mean, that's that's like my big problem with upgrading operating system, is because all it, it seems to do is make older systems obsolete. It's like, we're going to keep throwing in these new features to use up the processor that you spent a premium for until, like, the old systems just choke on it. That said, it it seems to run okay. I noticed it glitch out once, but I was doing a whole bunch of things in the background, so it wasn't a fair test. But what I can tell you is that its time, its time manipulation is very good. They have upgraded their time... Con- uh, their key locking for when you're stretching and compressing... A song so when you slow a tempo down you can slow it way down and still have it sound pretty damn good so what does it does it slow does it shift the pitch still or does it try to keep the pitch the same well even tractor pro 2 had um had key lock which which kept it as it was okay. transforming it it actually did real-time 
time compression and not just pitch shifting. So it just does a better job now. They actually took it out of house and went with a third party uh, algorithm and it shows because it works great. Audio software is getting damn good these it's days. It's brilliant. Damn good. I will say that there is a thing, the Tractor DJ app. I think it's free. I also think it's garbage. I don't think you should, don't fuck with it. Like, in a, in a professional setting. In any setting. Okay. The thing is trash. <laughs> like, you can set cue points, that's cool. You can set loops, that's cool. But there's just certain usability. Oh, man, we're going to get such shit mail from Native Instruments. Um, they're our sponsor. They're not going to. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, they, they sponsor me buying broken shit off of eBay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, this this app is so poorly thought out that if you, like, try to browse <laughs> for a song, you can't do it within the software. You have to open up a new window and drop it in. What? But you can't drop it onto the deck. You have to drop it into the collection and then drag it from the collection to the deck. Stop it. Embarrassment. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so, like, it's just, like, there's a lot. There's virtual DJ out there that you can get a free for, for personal use. There's um, DJ, D-J-A-Y, uh, which is, like, it's either free or very cheap for just, like, an iOS and, and Mac OS offering. It's like they entered this thing with a free app that, like, it doesn't do as well as anything else that's free. So it just didn't feel like a great. I, I don't know. I don't really know why they invested the time in making it. Maybe it'll be. Maybe it's the bedrock and it'll become cooler as time goes on. But I think mostly they wanted something that would be free for fucking around with if somebody bought the S2 MK3. Is it really to get people to get Tractor Pro? Is that how what you feel? Well, that's funky because, like, I'm pretty sure if you buy the Tractor S2 MK3, it comes with Tractor 3 Pro. Oh, uh, that's so, probably true, yeah. So I really don't, I don't really see a good use case for this thing. Maybe just for iPads, something to get people acquainted with the main <sighs> workflow? You know, I don't know, I don't know what this app looks like on the iPad. I've only done it on Mac OS. Maybe they have an iPad release, but mm, I don't know. I don't know either. But, you know, whatever. I'm not going to be too harsh because it was free. But Okay. Um, uh, Tractor 3, uh, some things I like, some things I don't care about. I think if you're in Tractor 2 and you feel like you're missing out, don't fucking sweat it. The, <laughs> the browser works a lot faster in Tractor 2. Really? Yeah, like hmm. there's a lag when you type something in you're searching for and it actually like appearing and that lag is like pretty fucking annoying because Tractor 2 was much faster. Yeah, it's pretty instant. Yeah, like so in Tractor 3, I just have this feeling like maybe there's no hit results and then I'm just kind of waiting for something and it's hmm. it's enough of a lag that it's kind of infuriating. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, hey. Maybe, uh, is it a system performance kind of a thing? And maybe it'd be faster on faster hardware? I don't know, because I have, you know... I mean, not that your computer is... It would, it's a six-year-old computer, but at the same time... It's a banging processor, though, still. It's, it's a, pretty good. It's a good... It's a 2.3 scaling um, processor on a Haswell. It's got a terabit... It had a terabit. I just upgraded to a two terabit solid state drive. Woo! Yeah, happy days are here again. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so, like, it really shouldn't be laggy. I don't know what they did with the collection. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it caches things differently. I'm not sure, but but all but the same, searching the collection should still take no time. Everything's indexed, right? That's what I say. Yeah, I don't know. So, like it. It's kind of frustrating the things that don't seem to work as well, but I'm about to do a complete format and do from the ground up build on my system. So I'll have an addendum to this review to this capsule review that like I don't know, maybe maybe when I 
don't go over a previous install and everything's a fresh install, maybe it'll be awesome. Now, can I ask, um, with Tractor 2, when you upgrade uh, mini, you know, smaller versions, um, it maintains different version numbers. Can you have Tractor 2 and Tractor 3 coexist on a system? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, with Tractor, it always makes, when you upgrade, it gives you a backup copy. Even though with a sizable collection, that backup copy is costing you like roughly 30 gig of analysis files every time you preserve one of your backup copies. So, you know, like if you have three iterations back, you've got, you know, 90 gig of files that are sitting there. So you don't want to keep them around forever. Um, I think it was Tractor 2.11.3 was the, the last the last one that they did. I didn't really find that it wasn't important to me over 2.11.2 or whatever the one prior to it was. It it may even have had some performance issues. I was I didn't get settled into it enough to really. You okay there, bud? <clears throat> had a moment. It's gonna sneeze, but oh, okay, it passed. You held it back. <clears throat> I like it. I gotta piss. Now it's time. <laughs> I gotta piss. That's that's the time. All right. All right. Hang on. Quick break. All right. Hey there, Darklings. This is DJ Omega Tullock. You may recognize me from stomping dance floors and delivering crushing and swaying beats at X Humanity and beyond. You're listening to Two Cups of Blood. All right. So, quick break. Yeah. Over. So, so did you? Do you have any new music that that you have any comments on? Anything brand new that's come out that is exciting? I have some other things. I think I'm going to save them for next time. Okay. Because the the Tiger Squawk retrospective was quite consuming right. uh, a few other things have happened but i'm just gonna save that so it was a research thing yeah yeah um there so i'm i'm not gonna go into like there are some new stuff and i'll, I'll talk about it there, i'm excited that we have some artists that i really admire that are going to be doing podcast ids for us um cool have, i have commitments from them but you know like any artist a commitment is not the same as a delivery so I have to, I have to, uh, you know, keep on them about that. I've adopted the the uh, oh, there's no rush, but I'll check in with you in a week. That that kind of okay uh, approach with them. Um, actually, I, I'm I haven't reached out to Static Bloom, but it might. They're super busy right now because they're doing like a world tour. But they just had a new release. Um, oh boy, I'm gonna have to. Oh jeez, gonna have to look it up because I can't remember the name of the release. But Static Bloom has gone in a direction that is, it's grittier and it's like harsher. It's good. Um, more aggressive. It's more aggressive. Yeah, it's like, it's like kind of a. I'm gonna, I guess I'll say it's a worse trip. Like, it's it's aggressive and dark, and it's it's a just it's artistically very interesting, but it is like grittier than their other stuff. Uh, the new release is called Asphyxia, and it, it just actually I th- it's a funny thing because I pre-ordered on Bandcamp, and I think it's supposed to drop June twenty something. But they just did it early for some reason. Nice. Maybe in advance. Maybe because they have their tour that they're doing, and they wanted people to hear what the new material was, so that they could hear it on the on the tour, and be familiar. Um, but this this edition, I it, it came out on Bandcamp, and you can I believe you can just download it. You yeah, it's a it's a commercial release. So if you buy it, I believe it's an instant download now because they moved the release date up. But it's it's pretty good. Um, they're good dudes. Fade and Dead Man are the are the, <laughs> the 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 powers behind Static Bloom, who are based out of Brooklyn. I feel like uh, I feel like they liked me much better the second time I ran into them in Ottawa because the first time I was like. 
I, I said hello to Fade, and then I asked the other guy what his name was, and I could have sworn he said Desmond, and Desmond doesn't... Well, this was in the club. They were playing a show. <laughs> they were playing an ex-human show, right? Yeah, they were. And the, things were noisy. Things are noisy, and I'm like, oh, hey, what's your name? He's like, D- Desmond. And I was like, oh, it's good to meet you, Desmond. And he's like, no, dead man. And I was like, wait. Desmond? <laughs> and he like really he gave me this look like are you fucking kidding me? And it's just like look, I I know Desmond is not like a really tough guy sounding name, but I, it was a sincere mistake. I was not giving him shit, but I feel like he felt like I was giving him shit. <laughs> But when I saw them again, I was just, like, happy to see them, and they seemed happy to see me. They're like, oh, shit, you're the guy from Albany, not remembering, like, I didn't, I kind of didn't like you the first time. (laughs) So, I guess we're good now. I guess, essentially, we're cool. They played a good show, and there was a big crowd, and I think the crowd was somewhat into it, and they probably had a good time. Oh, yeah. So, Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that made an impression. Well, they, uh, in Albany, you know, they did, and I don't, you know, I can honestly say as an introvert, I have, I have a, like, I'm I'm a weird introvert because I don't always seem like I'm an introvert, but that is, I know myself and I know that, like, I get tired of being around people sometimes and, like, you know, it's just, like, I know what gives me energy and I know what takes energy and beyond a certain point, being around people starts taking, and it, it gets hard to interact, and I just kind of want to withdraw a bit. Um, so I recognize that these dudes are introverts. They like performing, much like Brian Graupner. He likes performing, and that is exhilarating, but holding the extrovert off stage for a prolonged period takes energy and leaves him exhausted. Same with Static Bloom. I think they didn't really socialize much. They mostly just hung out with each other at the bar. And that's not a critical assessment. Whatever they got to do to be comfortable, I'm cool with. So, like, you know, I'm cool with all all kinds of introvert people. So I get it. But it was cool. Like, there's a thing where... You think an introvert doesn't like you or they're, like, maybe they're snobby or, like, you can't read their attitude correctly because it it seems like they are not impressed by your friendliness. And then later when you see them and you see that they recognize you and you see a reaction that they're happy that you're there and that they recognize you, it it totally changes the framing, which is like, oh, you're in a crowd of people you don't know, and everyone is trying to socialize with you, and you're not feeling it, and you just want to kind of, like, get ready for your show. You don't – it's nothing personal. It's just – how you're how you're rolling. So, like, I think that they're cool dudes. Fade and Deadman are, are both cool, and – they put on a great show. They they put a lot of energy and effort into what they do. They never phone it in. They've been great every time I've seen them. So, you know, I say check out their new album. It's gritty and dark and harsh, but it's dope. Cool. Yeah. Good tip. Thanks. Um. So, yeah, this one's going to be a little shorter than the last one. The last one was our longest one, I think. Well, it's, uh, I think, you know, our market research says that length is not everything, and yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I feel like we went a little long this time. We're kind of reeling it in for this one. Yeah. Um, any last things you want to get in? Hmm. I'm sure I have a few topics that I'm I'm itching at, but we're going to save it for the next one. Because right. it's good shit. I can't can't drop all the good shit right now. All right. Well, we'll do another one soon. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so that's all we got for these kids. Have all right. a good night. Hey, if if you feel the the need to go do yard work, <laughs> fuck that shit. <laughs> Stay inside, kids. Oh man. <laughs> see yeah. you. See you later. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace.
You are now in possession of the Aperture Science handheld portal device. The device, however, has not. 